Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, special webinar. Thanks for joining. My name's Dr. Wendy Scape, and I'm director of the Australian Centre for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Studies. Very conscious that we're joining from many lands around Australia, or sorry, around Queensland in particular, uh, today. And of course, we would like to acknowledge the Turbal and the Yugara people as the First Nations owners of the lands on which QUT stands, and to pay respect to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits and to reflect on the fact that QUT has always been a space of learning, teaching and research. We acknowledge the uh, important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play in the QUT and wider community. So it's my pleasure to welcome our chair for today, Linda Lavarch. So Linda, as many of you will know, um, is part of the advisory board long term here at ACPNS and a former research fellow, uh, former Minister for Justice here in Queensland and uh, Attorney General, and also chaired the Not-for-Profit Reform Council nationally, and of course has served on many board and, uh, and in the non boards in the non-profit sector. So I'm going to hand over to Linda as our chair for today. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Wendy. And can I say welcome to everyone to today's webinar. This is one of three um, webinars that ACPNS is holding this week um, to um, provide further consultation or, or to get feedback around the Department of Justice and Attorney General's consultation papers um, in relation to um, incorporated associations and changes to the Collections Act. Today's topic is the grievance procedure, which is under consultation paper one. And the purpose of the consultation is to identify a generic grievance procedure that can be inserted into the model rules. With us today um, to um, provide more information and, and discussion around the, uh, this proposal or the proposals, we have Wendy Devine, the Principal Policy Solicitor from the Queensland Law Society, who will present um, or will explain the new section 47A of the um, Associations and Corporations Act. We also um, are, are very honoured to have with us Jonathan Casson, who's a lawyer and principal of Governology, um, to help explore the issues around mediation and arbitration and the um, practical effects of a grievance um, policy procedure. And of course, we have our wonderful um, emeritus professor, Miles McGregor Lyons. Miles is, uh, and the, who is, um, of course, the founder here of ACPNS. Miles is going to um, kick off the discussions today, um, giving us a background to the, um, the legislation and um, this, the regulations to be made under it and the consultation paper. I also want to thank um, Dave um, Martin Scott, the Director of Policy and Projects of the Office of Regulatory Policy. Martin um, is um, from the Department of Justice and Attorney General. Martin is here with us to uh, um, answer any questions or take on notice any questions that um, you might have in relation to um, the consultation paper, the proposed regulation or the, or the, um, the new section 47A. So in terms of a little bit of housekeeping and, and the way that we will um, be um, presenting today, we'll hear first from Wendy. Um, actually, I stand corrected, we'll hear first from Miles with the background um, and then we'll hear from Wendy. After Wendy's um, presentation, we will we'll be taking questions and answers and um, a, a Q&A session. But what we ask is if you do your questions, if you could type your questions into the chat, for, um, chat box and then uh, we can um, um, Miles will go through the questions and, and um, we'll collect as many as we can um, and hopefully um, Martin would you know, uh, assist in answering those questions. What we'll also be doing is having a poll um, during the presentation. Um, after Wendy's presentation, we'll be asking a questions um, and that poll will pop up on your screen. If you could answer the poll, um, that would be very helpful in the feedback um, to, to the department as well. 
uh, after uh, Wendy's presentation, we'll then hear from Jonathan. And again, we'll be, um, um, I think we're just doing the polls after Wendy's presentation. And, and um, Jonathan's presentation is for um, any further discussion and we'll be taking um, questions after Jonathan's um, presentation. The, I just want to remind everyone, today's um, uh, webinar is being recorded, so um, as always, just be careful what you say. Um, it, it, the link will be shared um, and, and available after today's um, webinar. So, with all of that, I think we will get started and um, what we'll do, Wendy, is kick off with a mock, a, a, just a quick poll, just a mock poll, so that we, um, everyone can um, experience um, Zoom polling. So if you could just answer that, just answer the, that one question there. Okay, I think that might be the we're going to get. get well done, everybody. So we can share the results or stop sharing there. <laughs> uh, looks like everyone's got the gist of doing the poll. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll be asking two questions during today's presentation and um, would, would like you to um, uh, participate in that poll. They'll come after, after um, Wendy's presentation. So, Miles, I'm going to hand over to you now. Uh, thank you, Linda, and thank you for everybody for uh, joining today. Uh, we'll try and keep it uh, as quick as possible so there's maximum time for questions and answers. Uh, just a bit of background. The uh, Act to uh, revise the Incorporated Associations uh, Act was passed two years ago and assented to um, after, after that. Um, so we had COVID and the department was unable to um, consult about the regulations to give fullness to the Act. Um, so they're here now consulting uh, with the sector uh, and those about, um, in, about the regulations that are proposed. And there are three papers. Today, uh, we'll be doing uh, grievance uh, procedures. And it would help if you uh, had a copy of the paper uh, available to you to refer to, particularly as we'll be um, polling on the questions posed in the paper uh, so you can follow the uh, dotted uh, lines. Um, just a word of warning, um, if you don't like the Act, uh, too bad, too sad, that's all over, that's done and dusted. Um, we're only, uh, they're only consulting about the regulations uh, which will give brief life uh, to the um, statutory provisions. So if you're um, cranky about the Act, uh, that's for another day. Um, we're only having a look at the regulations at the moment. So Wendy, if you can go to the next slide, um, and I'll just say something about uh, grievance procedures and association disputes. Incorporated associations, and for that matter, unincorporated associations, are legends for uh, member internal disputes. Uh, they're often emotional. Um, they're often uh, protracted, uh, bitter. Um, there's no bottom line. Uh, people will literally spend every cent they have on uh, litigating or furthering uh, their cause to ensure that God is on their side uh, with respect to any disputes. Here are two recent uh, cases, and uh, you may know at uh, ACPNS, we summarize nonprofit legal cases, and you can uh, value, value yourself of them by having a look at the uh, ACPNS website under resources. But two, two cases which give um, uh, a bit of an inkling into some of the disputes. Uh, one was uh, Thompson and Cavalier King Cat. King Charles Spaniel Rescue Association. Um, and it was an ongoing dispute over about nine years, I think. Um, there were 341 filed documents, two aborted trials, uh, directions hearings, three unsuccessful appeals to the Court of Appeal, and one application to the High Court of Australia. And the person was all self-represented. So it was a busy, a busy body, um, a busy person rather. Uh, in all of this. Um, and I don't think justice was done all around, uh, frankly. Um, and it cost, even though he's self-represented, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
and the other case is equally as bizarre. Um, it's been a policy issue for a long time about um, how the Act regulates uh, running off to court. Uh, initially, in the original Act in Section 13, it required the Management Committee, before they instituted legal action, to get a, an opinion from a lawyer and table that at uh, the Management Committee meeting and before issuing proceedings to file an affidavit to that effect. Well, that didn't work really well. Um, the other way to prevent this was to say that you couldn't go to any court. It had to be the Supreme Court, the highest court in Queensland. Um, which is a very, very expensive and considerable delays um, to jostle amongst, uh, you know, those who are having murders and uh, hurt and large, um, large monetary disputes and various serious matters. Um, so it was a bar to to doing this. Other states have 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 put in magistrates' courts or or consumer tribunals to hear these matters um, at a lower at a lower level. Uh, which are more accessible, uh, not as uh, not as slow, and definitely not as expensive. Uh, but that hasn't been the policy of the uh, the government. They've still left it there at the Supreme Court, but they've put in a compulsory mediation uh, requirement if you have a dispute, uh, which is working sort of well in some other states. So that's what we're here to discuss today: um, how we can resolve these protracted internal disputes between members. Uh, by an internal mediation held and I guess financed by the incorporated association itself. So um, that's enough for me. Over to Wendy. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. And um, highly recommend the um, the case notes, the ACPNS um, case notes. I, it's my um, pleasure to um, introduce Wendy Devine. Wendy's the principal policy solicitor at the Queensland Law Society. Wendy works with Queensland solicitors to advocate to government on legal policy and law reform, issues affecting the legal profession and the Queensland community. As part of her role, Wendy has the care of the QLS Not-for-Profit Law Committee, and it's in this capacity um, that she's involved in the QL, she was involved in the QLS submission to Parliament on the Associations Incorporation Act changes. And, and uh, Wendy is a ACPNS alumni as well. So Wendy, uh, I will hand over to you and um, have um, you explain to us the new section 47A. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you, Wendy and Miles for that introduction. Um, my, my part of today's proceedings is just to give you an overview of the new section 47A uh, and also explore some of the issues that have been outlined in the discussion paper. So um, if we can move to the next slide, Wendy. Um, so one of the most significant changes in the recent amendments Miles mentioned uh, is the inclusion of this new section 47A which effectively requires incorporated associations to include a grievance procedure in the rules of the incorporated association. Now, if the rules of the association do not include a grievance procedure that's consistent with the requirements of this section, then the rules are taken to include the provisions of the model rules, which are being developed um, for the grievance procedure. So some of the key elements of section 47A are set out on the slide. Um, I think it's important to note that the discussion paper indicates that for the purposes of flexibility to, to produce grievance procedures that are tailored to the individual incorporated association's needs, um, the Act does not prescribe a specific procedure, but they do provide for certain fundamental natural justice principles with which a grievance procedure must comply. So 47A provides for a grievance procedure for disputes between members or a member in the management committee or a member in the association. Uh, the grievance procedure must include mediation as an option and it may provide for a person to decide the outcome of the dispute and Jonathan will, will come to that in a bit more detail later in the, in the session. Um, the discussion paper does clarify that 47A does not require all disputes to go to mediation. The best practice is that parties are first given an opportunity to resolve the dispute between themselves, um, but mediation is then an option if the dispute cannot be resolved. It's interesting, I think, to note that the section does contemplate that the association's rules 
could provide for a binding arbitration process, but it does not require that. Um, and again, Jonathan will touch on mediation and arbitration later, later in the discussion. Um, the procedural fairness principles, which are flagged on the, on the slide, uh, they're set out in subsection 4. The association must ensure that A, each party to the dispute has been given an opportunity to be heard, and B, that the mediator or any person engaged to decide the outcome of the dispute is unbiased. So they're two key principles that you'll come across um, in the legal context of ensuring that procedural fairness is reflected in a process, opportunity to be heard, and, and lack of bias. Uh, subsection 5 is interesting. Um, it provides that disciplinary action may not be taken against the complainant member or their representative in relation to the matter that's the subject of the grievance procedure until that grievance procedure is completed. Uh, and that will be the subject of our poll down here yeah. in, a, in a few minutes' time. Um, so the next slide, will you? Just to continue with the mechanics of the new section, Miles touched on um, section the Supreme Court option for disputes. Uh, section 72 has been updated to reference the grievance procedure process, but otherwise that process remains unchanged. Uh, and I just wanted to mention for those involved in associations with licensed premises, there are some particular considerations for you. The discussion paper touches on a couple of issues you might like to consider in more detail. Um, and I refer you to page 8 for that, those couple of paragraphs and also uh, proposed model rule 5 later in the paper. But I won't go into detail on those today. So the next slide. I thought it was worth touching on subsection 6 in a little bit more detail, and I've set that wording out on the slide in full. Um, the effect of this section, subsection is that if the association's rules do not include an appropriate grievance procedure, which complies with the requirements of the Act, then the rules for the association are taken to include the provisions of the model rule, which will be made, setting out the grievance procedure. This is different to the other model rule provisions, which only apply if an association specifically adopts the model rules. Um, this section will mean that the grievance procedure will be implied unless your association specifically has its own grievance procedure. It also means that even if your association has previously registered its rules, then the grievance procedure rules will be implied even though your adopted rules don't address the issue. So after commencement, these model rules will be implied into your constitution and your rules unless you've previously addressed it elsewhere. Um, and as identified by Parliamentary Council through, through the legislation, legislative process, this actually means the legislation will have some retrospective effect. So if your association rules were registered a few years ago, um, regardless of, of when they are registered, after commencement of these new provisions, the grievance procedure will be implied into your, into your rules unless you otherwise address it with your own grievance procedure. Um, Parliamentary Council considered that notwithstanding the retrospective effect of these provisions, it was justified because the legislation was intended to ensure that the members of an incorporated association have access to a fair dispute resolution process. Next slide. How are we doing for time? Oh, good. Great. Um, so, what about an external grievance procedure process? Um, what if you, as an association, um, already ha are obligated to observe a grievance resolution procedure um, that applies because you might be part of a national or an international body with its own processes? Um, well, DJAG is specifically seeking your views on how the rules of an association might recognise an external grievance procedure like this. Uh, and if this is how your associations operate, your association operates, um, then your comments are really welcomed on this point. Because there might be a few different models out there, and if you can turn your mind to that um, and, and think it through, I think that would be really helpful to get that practical feedback. Um, the paper does indicate that the requirements of Section 47A, so natural justice, mediation, etc., can still be met if the rules of the association provide that the association will observe a particular grievance procedure which is specifically referenced in the rules. 
So you do need to connect your rules to the external process and then that external process does need to comply with the principles and the substance of Section 47A as well. The benefit of taking this approach is that the association won't need to import the whole of the external procedure into their rules. Um, they can simply incorporate by reference. Um, and then they don't need to lodge their changes if the external grievance procedure changes. So that's the current proposal under the, under the paper. Um, one of the issues you might also like to consider, and it's discussed in the paper, is whether for an external procedure for your entity, should there be additional criteria which is applied? Um, so for example, in addition to the rules, the external rules, needing to comply with 47A generally, should an additional criterion be that the association has an obligation to follow the external process because they're a member of a parent body, of a national body or an international body? Should that be a specific criterion? Um, Section, sorry, page seven of the discussion paper has a bit more information about this particular point. Um, and if, if this is you, if you've got an external association you'd like to incorporate or reference, have a read through that part and think through some of the issues there. Um, I think we might just move on actually. So just watching the time there. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, and so the next slide, um, just to flag with you, interaction the interaction of 47A with disciplinary procedures. Um, this might be something you might like to consider in your particular circumstances. The disciplinary procedure provision means that you can't um, proceed with a, with a disciplinary procedure until you complete your grievance procedure. Questions being asked in, in some contexts, what if excluding someone from an organisation uh, needs to be done from for reasons of health and safety? Um, what if that grievance procedure would delay uh, an action that's not quite appropriate in your context and needs more, imme more immediate action um, than waiting for that grievance procedure to be, to be completed? Uh, so that's something you might like to consider depending on your particular circumstances. Uh, mediation, again, Jonathan will, will come to mediation in a bit more detail. Um, I've just put some dot points there around um, some of the features there or issues you might like to consider, mediation versus arbitration, um, what happens if your mediated outcome is inconsistent with other provisions um, in the legislation. So you may, for example, as a mediated outcome, decide to allow someone more time to deal with a particular issue, but then that might trigger some timing issues around compliance with um, lodgement of material or information under the, under the legislation. Wanted to briefly touch on confidentiality. Um, the discussion paper does not is silent on whether mediations should be confidential, whether material provided or statements or assertions made in mediations should be confidential. Um, in our experience, usually some clear statement about confidentiality will likely encourage frank and open participation in a mediated out, mediated process, um, and we're aware that. In other contexts, um, legislation setting out a similar framework do, does specifically address this point. Um, the Farm Business Debt Mediation Act, for example, specifically outlines, outlines confidentiality obligations for mediations under that framework. Uh, and the Small Business Commissioner Act also um, has a mediation framework and, and contemplates that anything said in a mediation conference um, is not admissible in subsequent proceedings. So, um, there's a couple of examples there you might like to look at um, and consider whether that's something you'd like to address in a submission. Uh, and the paper's also silent on who pays for the costs of the mediation. Um, and again, I'd refer you to the Farm Business Debt Mediation Act, uh, which starts at each party to a mediation pays their own costs and pays half of the mediator's fees. So um, that's yeah, one other issue that's not specifically addressed in the paper, but at a practical level, you might like to consider. Linda, I think that's all I had. <laughs> it's plenty to think about, Wendy, and thank you for um, you know, provoking such thought and, and, and drawing out the issues in the paper. Now, um, if you've got any questions, if you could type them into the chat facility, that would be great. Um, in the meantime, uh, Wendy touched on that question 
around the um, grievance, the intersection between a grievance procedure and a disciplinary procedure. So we've got a poll question to ask here. Um, so did you want to put up poll number two, Wendy? Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Yes. So this question is where a person attempts to initiate the grievance procedure, but the management committee is aware of grounds for d disciplinary action. Should the management committee be required to decide whether or not to act on those grounds within a within specific? Yes, yes. Actually, we probably missed a little bit off. Um, within a certain time frame, that should read within a certain time frame. So, should they be given a, a, a set time frame that those um, the decision needs to be made whether to act on the grounds of discipline? Yes, no, or not sure. Uh, not sure. Okay. So, the from the poll, we've got um, sixty three percent um, say yes. There should be a certain time frame. And there's 38% um, are not sure. The next question is, if there, if there is a certain time frame, then what should that time frame be? So if you put up poll number three, yes. Wendy, yes. that would be great. And if I get everybody to answer poll three. So what should that time frame be? Looks like... A, a comprehensive, you know, a, the majority would like 28 business days a month to be able to, to make no. that decision. Not a month. No. Now, Miles, are there any questions for Wendy, Martin or yourself at this point in time? Uh, Linda, there aren't any questions in the chat room that I can see, but I've got a question uh, for, um, for either Martin or, or Wendy. What's the difference between um, a mediation and an arbitration? Is that, is that ideally directed at Jonathan? <laughs> I'm very happy to stay out of this. <laughs> well, look, I, I thought that might be uh, part of Jonathan's uh, upcoming presentation, but from our perspective, uh, a mediation is where you uh, engage a third party to... Um, guide you to a decision and an arbitration is basically a cherry on top of that where someone makes a decision for you. Would that be right, Jonathan, roughly? Uh, well, the, the fundamental difference is that uh, the, uh, in a mediation, the parties strive to find their own decision and tailor the, um, the result for the resolution to their own needs. Uh, and it's a voluntary process. The arbitration is one that will be uh, taken away from them and a decision be made and the decision might well be uh, one that neither party um, wants. So it can be very, very difficult. Um, uh, arbitration is also more formal. I'll go through, I'll go through, I, I must say I only touch them, we've got so few minutes uh, in the talk, but uh, the arbitration is uh, a much, much more formal uh, and often will be a lot more legal uh, than a, uh, a mediation. So Wendy, I've got another question. Uh, we have a policy and procedure about grievance of committee members. Should we update that to meet the requirements of Section 47A and reference in the model rules? Uh, I will also ask Martin's view on this, but um, given the way that the discussion paper invites organisations to have an external um, document uh, that sets out a grievance procedure, um, it sounds like it would qualify as an external document, but yes, it does need to be consistent with the principles in 47A in order to, to gain, that, um, gain that protection of the legislation. Martin, is that, is that consistent with what you would say? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I'll just add, we did look at a number of um, grievance procedures of that nature, uh, like say um, organisations with uh, national affiliations and so forth to see what procedures they were required to um, to observe in respect of uh, disputes. And look, in most cases, um, they provided for mediation, they provided for an unbiased uh, mediator or decision maker, whoever that was, whether it was a committee member past or present, or, or they needed to be a lawyer or whatever, there was the unbiased requirement and there was a mediation requirement. And 
I don't think we found one that wasn't compliant with the principles of 47A. Not to say they're not out there and needing updates, but um, I think most of those um, major ones would be compliant. Good. And another question is, who would make the decision on who the mediator is? That's uh, perhaps a, a matter for the procedure itself. I think the discussion paper uh, um, suggests that when it's a member uh, versus member dispute, it would be the uh, management committee. And then there's some, uh, there is a suggestion in there about what happens if it's a, a dispute between a member and the association. Uh, I think we propose that if uh, no agreement, if they can't agree to a, uh, a mediator, it should be a Department of Justice Dispute Resolution Centre. Yeah. But we're open to submissions on that and, um, and yeah. advice, of course. Uh, Martin, we've got a, got a few minutes up our sleeves as I read it. Um, could you just tell us about the Department Resolution Centre? Uh, look, um, I'm, I'm not that familiar with another part of justice, uh, you know, justice services area. Um, but there is, um, at the moment and for many years, uh, OFT have directed um, associations uh, with disputes to um, the uh, Department of Justice Dispute Resolution Centres uh, where uh, mediators are engaged and available uh, for no charge, I believe, to, um, to, to um, consider disputes of this and other natures. Oh, I can provide you the link if you like. I'll, um, I'll uh, send it through in the chat or uh, provide it at a session. Thank you, Martin. But, but, Wendy, can I uh, just ask a question? That last poll talked about the number of days. I was yes. concerned that it's business days. So that 28 business days is actually six, six or more weeks. So it's just something to bear in mind. Okay. I, I, I thought the question was just 28 days rather than business days. Yeah. But yeah, so, okay. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. Now we might, um, on that cue, I'll hand over to you, to you, Jonathan, for your presentation today. And I'll just do an introduction. Um, Jonathan is a non-executive director, a lawyer, a mediator, a, and a chartered governance professional. He is a partner and chair of the specialist law firm Governology and holds fellowships with both the Australian Institute of Company Directors and the Governance Institute um, of Australia. Jonathan's also a chartered secretary and I think most importantly, an ACPNS alumni. Jonathan has spent a lifetime advising and working in the non-profit sector, and today we have the benefit of his passion and his knowledge of governance in the, his passion for the sector and his knowledge of governance in the sector. Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, okay. uh, I was just going to say, if you just, um, we'll just we've got your slides, so we'll, um, Wendy will be operating it from here. All good? Yeah, yeah. That, no, that's great. I, I can't remember what, what the slides say now, so let's just let's uh, <laughs> uh, just, just just go. We'll just go with it. Um, I was asked a, a oh, certain you. number of questions um, um, to talk to, but I'll just start off this. I I I got to say I'm delighted that I'm here. Um, I have uh, I had the um, pleasure and the benefit of being. Um, uh, Took, took the course at ACPNS under both um, uh, Miles and Wendy. And so uh, if anybody's in, seriously involved in not-for-profit and they haven't done the course, they should really seriously think about it. It's a fantastic uh, uh, course. Now, I'm approaching this, though, today as a consumer, not a practitioner. So I trained before mediation became a, an industry, and I railed against the incursions of lawyers and barristers and retired chief justices who seem to want to impose uh, regimes similar to uh, pleading, because uh, I see that the process in mediation should allow all agreed parties to come to their own resolution, tailor-made for them by them. But having said that, it's absolutely clear that everybody has, uh, or so no one has the same level of education and the same uh, capacity for uh, to be able to articulate their own ideas and, and to express themselves, so often assistance is needed. So uh, I have to uh, allow the fact that maybe lawyers should get involved. Now, um, disputes certainly happen. Um, it's very, therefore very useful to have a simple procedure 
to resolve complaints. I mean, we call that both the committee members and the members themselves share the responsibility to ensure that the association operates according to its rules and to the law. And so the best thing to do is to resolve uh, disputes informally. Um, the idea of the dispute resolution is to uh, reduce disharmony. Uh, and we'll talk about the role that the mediator takes in a little time. Now, we've heard, uh, thank you uh, uh, for the uh, outline on uh, how the Act is. Um, uh, incorporated associations are going to be given time to determine whether they want to adopt the grievance procedures in the model rules or adopt their own procedure. Uh, sorry, procedure. And the issue is going to be for them uh, what's better. Um, it might be that adopting your own customized dispute process can uh, reflect exactly what it is that the uh, association wants. You've got to probably have a little bit of time and money to be able to do that. Uh, we don't yet know exactly what the um, model rules are going to say, um, but uh, we know the, the, the basics of it under Section 47A. So just to talk about whether or not you should have your own rules, bear in mind the grievance procedure must include unbiased mediation and it might provide for an unbiased person to arbitrate. Uh, a member must be allowed to have another person act on their behalf. All parties must be given an opportunity to be heard. And once, as we know, once the grievance procedure is started, the association must not take disciplinary action against the member or the member's representative. So those are the core issues, I think. Uh, we heard from Wendy that if you're going to write your own um, uh, process, you have to have that in. So there are alternatives, therefore, to resolve disputes. Um, whilst generally speaking, mediation is to be preferred, in my point of view, it is possible that the process cho chosen by the association could be a mixture of mediation and arbitration, or the old uh, formula of mediation, conciliation and arbitration. I'm not going to get into um, uh, conciliation today. So I thought we'd look first at mediation. Um, uh, we'll just stay with the slide we've got for the moment. So before you start a mediation process, you must be certain about what you want to achieve. Because it's a process and it's not a panacea. It's not going to be a guarantee a result. And the mediator has no decision-making power. The best mediators step back and allow the parties to discuss. It has to be entirely voluntarily so the parties can identify the real, essential, and fundamental differences between them. When the process goes on, if it's done well, it allows um, people to sort of the scales to fall from their eyes and they see that there are other ways of resolving the dispute. Um, it should, or, I, I, whilst the Act doesn't deal with it, I believe it should always be confidential and without prejudice. It's not going to work if um, uh, any of the stuff said in the mediation can then be repeated uh, in court. So that, that we're going to have to look at that. Um, uh, and essential element is that a decision maker must either attend or be close at hand because it's no point going through it and spend several hours and then somebody says, oh, I've got to take this back to the board. That's just what wastes everybody's time. Also, there's no point attending a mediation if you're not willing to consider alternatives. Mediation is more informal and it encourages the parties, excuse me, I'm going too fast, um, it encourages the parties um, to uh, consider alternatives and options. Um, and uh, as it was raised earlier, in fact, can we go to another, the next slide? And maybe the slide after that, and we'll come back to this slide. That's it. So I think that um, that very good looking person behind bars there is me at early years of university. And um, my, um, uh, I, I do believe, I know it's in the discussion paper, that unresolved disciplinary procedures and liquor licensing matters should not be part of this scheme. Um, uh, I can't, uh, I can't uh, see how it would work. But as I say, you need to know what you want to achieve and be prepared to compromise. So if you can go back to the slide just before, we're looking here at um, uh, some ideas I put together as the difference between mediation and arbitration. Now, arbitration shares some elements 
of mediation, but it is much more formal. Uh, the arbitrator, not the parties, will make a decision, uh, and it has an element of sudden death about it, and the result is not as what anticipated. You've got to bear in mind arbitration is also covered by the Commercial Arbitration Act. You've got to look to see whether the arbitration we're talking about fits within those. The Queensland Arbitration Act um, is harmonised, so it's part of the national the national scheme. Um, uh, uh, we can't really go through every line by line, but it's useful perhaps to look at that afterwards. And I'd be very happy uh, if anybody wants to raise something that uh, uh, I've uh, something important that they feel is not in the uh, in in that uh, template. So my next um, my next point is what makes a uh, uh, a best mediator. Um, now I don't think I have a slide for this, but uh, I suggest that when you're choosing a mediator, if you can, um, ask these questions. What experience does the mediator have? Do they understand the sector? Your sector might be very different, um, and not-for-profit, of course, is its own sector, but you could, you'll be in a certain particular industry, uh, and you'll have issues uh, to, to deal with. Um, should you get a non-legal mediator? It may well be that you need uh, uh, an expert in, in, in the field of what the dispute's about. Bear in mind, though, if you use somebody who's not legally qualified or doesn't really understand um, the act, you might end up with a uh, result that's illegal. Um, uh, and I don't know whether I mentioned it in the slide, but one result might be uh, that uh, you decide that the complainant should be put onto the management committee. Well. That won't work if the manager, if, if there's no if he, he or she is not elected. So you've got to be very careful that whoever's doing it understands those rules. Now, a mediator, I think, should take the role of a critical friend. That's someone who's willing to ask the hard question and encourage the participants to think more deeply and rationally on the issue. And I must arrange a signed settlement agreement at the end of the mediation. Um, I asked the question, is the Queensland Department of Justice and Attorney General uh, an appropriate resource? And I see the, uh, the link is there, that's fantastic. Um, uh, it looks to me like it's probably a very good resource. Um, when we look at the cost in a, in a moment, knowing that that's a free, uh, a free uh, result, it might, uh, a resource, it may well be that people will choose it for that. But you've got to ask, ask uh, if there's legislation or a code that, um, pushes you into a particular area. There might be, you might have a funding agreement that says disputes go somewhere, or you may um, uh, be part of a sector that has its own uh, views. Um, I hope I'm not over time. Um, uh, you've got to ask, will, will the mediation be quick? What's the experience with this mediator? And you can make inquiries and find out whether mediators uh, are on the ball or not. I had an experience of choosing a mediator who uh, said, yes, he was available, yes, he was going to do it all. Uh, and then when we came to found out that he had two months of other mediations in front of us, wasted our time. Um, uh, so uh, you just have to, you know, you have to make, make the inquiries if you can. And will you have lawyers along as well? That's where the cost is going to be. And do those lawyers charge a flat fee or a on billable hours? And usually, I think, mostly, it's going to be on billable hours. So, assuming that you've found the right media, no, mediator, what are the tips for resolving the conflict? I suggest you encourage your client, or you yourself, if you're going to be the representative, to be an active listener. Responding in a way that shows that each party is listening to the other, and that they understand what they're going. You really need to have patience. The big deal is separating people from the conflict. Don't look at the history and the baggage that they've grown. Stay positive and find out whether there is a non-legal resolution. It could be very useful, so long as it's not illegal, as I said before. And I want to just deal very quickly um, whether uh, about the cost. Um, mediators have different costs. You can uh, expect a fee for setting up the mediation and then a rate based on perhaps a half day or a day rate. 
and commercial mediators can charge anywhere from $500 for half a day to $5,000 for a day and more. So it makes the department uh, uh, service uh, very uh, um, attractive to small associations. Um, uh, so say it's a, it's a free free state. Um, uh, it's also, uh, for example, the New South Wales Small Business Commissioner has a set rate of $330 uh, for four hours with an hourly rate thereafter. So um, there it is. And who pays? Well, practically, practically uh, costs are usually shared for the mediation and each party pays for their own, but that will depend on what um, what comes with here. So um, I don't know whether I'm, 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 I, my time is not on, so I don't know where, I'm, am I out of time? Um, you've got a couple more minutes, Jonathan, if there's something else you wanted to add. Not really, just wanted to say it needs to be confidential. It needs to be without prejudice. Um, anything said can't be used in evidence in a subsequent arbitration or court action. I would prefer mediation before um, you went to arbitration. Uh, and um, uh, uh, the, I think that's where it is. There's, there's this um, thing that mediators do called the BATNA, the best alternative to no agreement. And when it comes to things dealing with uh, money, it's a very good process. So as you know, for example, if you don't settle the mediation, you might end up in court. If your dispute is over $10,000, going to court might cost you five, uh, even in a small court. So uh, is it worth is it worth not settling on the day? Uh, anyway, they're, they're things to talk about in more detail at another time. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan, you've certainly raised some really important questions that we need to ask. Um, in relation to um, you know, dispute resolution. Uh, now over to you, Miles. Are there um, questions um, in the chat at uh, all? Thanks, thanks, Linda. We have uh, one good question. Uh, should both parties sign off on a report written by a mediator? Uh, they should sign off on an agreement if that's done. Um, it's not not in my experience usual to have a report if 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 they haven't agreed to a result then i don't think a mediator's report would be useful with arbitration you can usually have reports in two types um uh, they call them non-speaking and speaking where the arbitrator's decision is just put down as, as a sh short paragraph or you can have a several page long discussion as to why or how the mediator got to sorry the arbitrator got to that result but i've not seen it in mediation but obviously there's people with a lot more experience than me in that area um, jonathan what happens if the mediation comes to an agreement but that agreement in a week or a month or a year breaks down again what's the normal course well it it it, it, it it'll be done by way of a deed and it, it will be enforced, usually it will be enforceable. Uh, and so uh, you either end up relitigating the thing, but the, uh, the better view is that um, you, you get the agreement in a way that makes uh, the parties comfortable and uh, they agree to live with it, um, but it, it is an enforceable deed at the end of the day. So, so, it's, so it's, it's, a it's, a practical, it's a practical thing. Um, uh, you know, it's um, uh, one, one of those things. Uh, I, I, I just saw that thing about the certificate. I think that comes to a, uh, for, a uh, for, for different reasons, but we can come to that. Uh, Linda, there's another question uh, which says, in some unsuccessful mediations I've been to, the mediator has issued, filed in court a certificate at the end of it, certifying the mediation failed to settle. So, Wendy or Jonathan, Jonathan, do you yeah, well, want to... Well, that, that it, it, certainly if it's court, um, uh, court ordered mediation, that is likely to be um, essential. Yeah. And certainly um, uh, courts are now saying you can't come to court without having attempted mediation. The, the problem, with some of those mediations is that they aren't voluntary. That is, people turn up. I've been to a mediation where the first thing the mediator asked is, um, uh, 
Are we uh, are we going to spend any time this morning, or do you just want me to write the certificate that you turned up? And that was the beginning of the mediation. I was a personally I was appalled, but that's how it was because we were there, and we both sides did want to resolve it and didn't need to hear uh, some jaundiced view about how mediation was just ticking boxes. Jonathan, now uh, what happens if a mediation date is set, but but a party doesn't turn up to it? What do you do then? Well, there's 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 no um, cost order in these things, so you get very very frustrated and angry, um, uh, uh, or um, may, maybe you control your anger. But there's not much you can do because it's a voluntary process, and if they don't turn up, they don't turn up. So if um, if the person doesn't turn up, um, does that mean that you've had a mediation, so can then go to court or? Oh, um, uh, I, I think that would, I'd have to look more specifically at any specific rules. But generally, yes, there would have been an, you'd think there'd been an attempt at uh, mediation. I don't know what the mediator would write on his certificate in that case. And I should think there are people in the chat room who might have better ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, Miles and Jonathan, if I could just add to that, um, Jonathan touched on court ordered mediation before. Uh, what we've got here um, in section, the amended 72, section 72, of the Act is that um, an association or a member of the association can't apply to the Supreme Court for adjudication of a dispute unless they've made reasonable attempts to resolve the dispute under the grievance procedure. Thank so that's, that's right. Yeah. The, that, the, the, the thing that's the thing that I, I missed out on to Ma answering Miles' question. They have to be reasonable. Has been reasonable attempts. So if you don't turn up, you won't have. So, but what do you do, Wendy? Then, if you turn up, but they don't turn up. Is that one way of them stopping you from going to court because there's not been a reasonable attempt? Um, Martin might have a view on how that might play out, but I, I would expect when you make your application to court, the first thing the judge will say is, have you guys tried to mediate this? Hmm. Um, uh, Martin, have you got some well, experience with that? Oh, no experience, but um, how I think it would work here, Wendy, is that if you um, front up with evidence that you've been to mediation and you're the one making the application to the court, yeah. Um, and the other party hasn't shown, then you've made all efforts. And um, it's been on both side. Mm -hmm. Yes. So are there any, any further questions at all? No? Well, I'm going to thank our presenters today, Wendy and Jonathan and Miles, and thank you, Martin, um, for um, being available and mm -hmm. participating in right. today's webinar. Um, we've got, we can't leave you without another poll. So our next poll is our feedback. So if um, we could kindly ask you to um, give us the feedback on how likely it is that you would recommend a recording of this webinar to a colleague. I'll give you a few little just a little minute to um, fill that in for us and thank you for your feedback so thank you for me did you want to, to wrap up with it all i would just like to as always thank meritus professor miles mcgregor lowndes who has stepped up and uh and i was going to say conned but encouraged his <laughs> colleagues and <laughs> alumni and as always, I am so enormously proud of ACPNS alumni and friends uh, for doing something that I think is practical uh, and solid and substantive. So please spread the word about this information. Uh, ACPNS is about knowledge impact for a better world. So uh, we love it if people can take the resources that are freely available and put them where they can be most used. Thank you.